Hi presenters, please can I ask you to switch your cameras on, we are about to go live in 20 seconds. Good day guys, we need to go live, please switch your cameras on. Okay guys, we're about to go live, please stand by. Hello and welcome everyone. It's heartwarming to be joined by each of you from the five host cities of the seventh African Investigative Journalism Conference and from across the continent. In this day one session of AIGC 2021 titled Undercover Journalism, we bring together three brave reporters who have used different tricks to disguise themselves while doing their investigations. Uh, this trial of reporters who are well known to most of you across Africa will share their experiences and offer their advice and tips on how to do undercover journalism within the continent. So welcome again. My name is Benon Habatoluka. I am the Africa editor for the Global Investigative Journalism Network and I will be your moderator today. Uh, we are offering translation into French during this session. And um, so you can choose to listen to this online discussion in either English or French. Please find details on your over app. So again, welcome to this uh, AIGC 2021 session on undercover journalism. Now, before I introduce our panelists, let me just say that undercover journalism is on the rise across the continent. And that means that the discussions about some of the contentious issues around the practice are also increasing. So it's just as well that we have uh, some of Africa's foremost undercover investigative journalists to discuss this topic today. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. I'm delighted 
that we are joined. Uh, we've been joined today by three journalists who have done some of the most revelatory um, and thought-provoking undercover investigations in Africa over the past 12 months. They will give us three separate presentations, and then after that, we'll take questions. Um, many of you will know Anas, Arameo Anas uh, from Ghana. Anas has used this guys to find his way into asylums, brothels, prisons, orphanages, and villages, where he methodically gathers evidence for hard-hitting stories, and then presents the evidence to authorities who prosecute uh, these criminals in the courts of law. In his last investigative work, a nurse went undercover for two years to expose a total of 34 judges engaged in corruption-related activities. Uh, we, are we are also joined by Fisayo Soyombo from Nigeria, who is a founder of the Foundation for Investigative Journalism. Fisayo spent five days in a police cell as a suspect and eight as an inmate in Ikoi prison to track corruption in Nigeria's criminal justice system. He also drove the equivalent of a stolen vehicle from Abuja to Lagos, passing through a whooping 86 checkpoints. Uh, third on our list of panelists is Fata Al Hamdani uh, from Sudan. Fate is a freelance journalist whose work has appeared, among others, uh, on the BBC. Most recently, he went undercover at the Sud uh, Sudanese Islamic educational institutions called Harwas. In those schools, he found that many of the young students undergo mis uh, gross mistreatment, which he will tell us more about during his presentation. Uh, we will want to hear from you as well, uh, so please submit your questions and we'll get our panelists to respond to as many as we can. You can send your questions both in English and French, and uh, they will be translated. You can actually start uh, asking the questions now. Now, let's um, get started with uh, Fateh, who will share with us uh, his uh, experiences as an undercover uh, reporter. Fate, over to you, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. And uh, thank you, Africa Investigative Journalism Conference. Uh, I need to say something. Uh, my English is so bad. Uh, can you speak uh, Arabic? Hello. Uh, Fateh, you can go ahead and uh, speak. Uh, we don't have a translator for Arabic, unfortunately. Um, uh, please share with us um, how you can in English. I think uh, the, the main idea is to get to know how you did your investigative reporting. Mm -hmm. I think I can't do, uh, speak, I'm sorry, because I can't do, to get point what I want to say. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, as we handle the issue of getting you a translator in Arabic, um, uh, give us a few moments to, to, to do that. Uh, I will then move to Kisayo, who will share his experiences uh, doing a lot of the undercover reporting he's done in, uh, in Nigeria. Afisai, over to you, please. Sorry, I, I didn't get that. Can you repeat? Was yes. that for me? Um, yes, I was saying that uh, as a way to get a translator for Fate, uh, could you please share your experiences and your presentation um, on how you, you've done your investigative reporting in, uh, in Nigeria. Okay, thank you very much. I would have loved to share a screen, but I have some problems connecting from my PC, so I'm using my phone. So I'll just talk 
without visuals. Uh, my most recent undercover story was about, uh, well, slightly undercover, uh, about the protesters that were killed at the at the Lekki Toll Gate. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'll talk about the prison undercover, uh, an investigation that saw me spend a total of two weeks in detention, you know, five days at the police cell, um, eight in prison, I was in court for a few hours. The entire idea was to expose the, the corruption. Sorry, this is going to come back in a, in a few seconds. The entire idea was to expose the corruption in Nigeria's criminal justice system. And I didn't want to write a third party account. I didn't want to speak with ex inmates. I didn't want to speak with policemen. Of course, police will not tell you the truth. Uh, the, the, the judges will not tell you the truth. The warders in prison will not say the, the truth. So I wanted to experience it firsthand. I'd learned that a lot of corruption was going on, you know, that it was so bad that the warders who were looking after prison inmates were themselves deserving of being, of being locked in prison. You know, because of the crimes they had committed and you had inmates go in prison and come out and rather than become repentance, they became even more hardened because they saw themselves as not any different from the prisoners um, in court, chaining them, you know. So I pretended like I'd committed an offense, uh, like I bought a vehicle, what, 2.8 billion naira, I paid 500,000 naira, and I didn't pay the balance of 2.3 million naira, you know. So the police got me arrested, got me um, detained and started asking for bribes from the complainants who was my, my cousin, by the way. You know, started demanding bribes from the one, expecting every morning they would come out to say, Who's the relative you have who can make a phone call for you, who can pay bribes? And because it didn't happen, they kept me there for five days. The law in Nigeria says that if a court is within 40 kilometer radius, you have to arraign any suspect within 48 hours. If it's more than 40 kilometer radius, you need a court order to detain the person for longer. And they never arraigned me you know, in court until five days after it became clear that I wasn't going to pay any bribes and they, they put me to court. One big discovery that I had in the police station was that the NSAS protest of last year that shook the country and probably the rest of the continent was justified. An example, I came, I was arrested supposedly because I paid part of the money for a car and I didn't remit the balance. But guess what? There was this day I wanted to have my bath in the police cell and I was calling for the policewoman to open the gate of my cell so I could bathe. And she told me in the pigeon, your offense no rich make you bath. Meaning that I didn't deserve to have a bath because of the magnitude of my offense. And I'm short-sighted. I had to call one of my fellow inmates to say, look at that board. There is a board where you know, names of suspects and their offenses are always recorded. What, what is written as my offense? And the person said, killing and hijacking of SUV. You know, meanwhile, it was just that I, I, I didn't complete the payment, but now they are saying I hijacked an SUV, which didn't happen. So that experience taught me that a lot of the things that are going on in the justice system escape notice of the public, because of the absence of undercover reporting. And so when people argue about the method for undercover reporting, the propriety and all that, the answer is always, as long as the public interest is bigger than the method employed, there can't be anything wrong. So I ask people, which one is better? For me, not to have used a fake name and not to have, to have cooked up a crime to get into jail. Is it that one that is better or having the opportunity to understand the magnitude of the problem in Nigeria's justice system? From police cell, I was taken to court. And while in court, someone came to me and said, look, I'm close to the magistrate. If you have money to pay, I think the person asked for 200 or 200,000 naira, you would sleep in your house tonight. Meanwhile, the magistrate had ruled that I was to be remanded in prison which means that once you have your money, even if it, there is a ruling that you should be remanded in prison, once you pay the right people, you will sleep in your house. 
So what kind of justice system do we then say we have? And then by the time I got to prison, I also found out that if you have money, right there in court, the prison warders were coming to me to say, if I paid them, they would get me fantastic accommodation in prison. You know, meaning that with your money, while the rest of the public are claiming that, oh, you are in jail and you are suffering, you are indeed enjoying. The only thing you are denied is your freedom. Everything else, you eat well in feeding, in prison, you feed fat, you smoke if you want to, you know, you, 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 you have nice accommodation in prison as long as you are willing to pay bribes, you know. And the most important of all is that you can't even erase your record from the prison. Meanwhile, there is a law that bans ex-convicts from holding political office. Only God knows how many political office, past and current political office holders we have in Nigeria who are indeed ex-convicts because they came in and they managed to erase their record from, for, 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 from the prison system. I'm not going to speak for so long because I understand it's a one-hour session. There are three other presenters. But um, basically, a lot of people who don't support undercover have to understand that as long as it's not done for self-serving objectives the biggest stories to be told especially in africa we have a freedom of information bill in nigeria nobody respects it the things you want to know you're not going to ask the government and they tell you and then the only way forward or the the, the surest way to get any information um independently without third party recourse is undercover as long as the method exposes information that is good for the overall development of the people there can't be anything wrong with it. We seem to be losing you, Fisayo. Hello, Fisayo, we seem to be losing you. Yes, yes, I, I, I finished my presentation. Oh, okay then, okay. Um, so we, we apologize that we were not able to, we, we don't have an Arabic English translator. We provided uh, an English to French translation, but we were not aware that we, of the need to, to have uh, a translator for FATE. Uh, we apologize about that. So Fisayo, I think uh, I'm going to have to throw a lot of the questions to you. So it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation between me and you. Um, now, based on what you have just said, uh, you can, I, you ca yes. I can see. Yes, I can see. We can, we can assess that. Um, you know, this is a risky endeavor. Investigative journalism is risky. If you're caught, your goose is cooked, uh, so to speak. So, and yet we are told that um, there is no story that's really worth your life in, in, in journalism. So how do you determine which risk to take and which one is too much? How do you determine it's, you know, I should be going to, to prison for a few days to document what's going on there? How do you determine I should uh, take on any other investigation? Uh, how do you weigh those risks? Thank you. You know, when people say no story is worth your life, that's very true. But I can tell you that that is only half of the story. That's just 50% of the story. On yeah. the other side of that saying is another one. Fortune favors the brave. Um, I always say that as long as your work is... So I say fortune favors the brave because the biggest stories that are to be told all require some measure of bravery. Even if you're not going undercover, even if it's just investigative, the biggest stories that, that the most important stories that journalists have to tell require some measure of bravery. Bravery is a core component of good journalism. You can't be timid. If you are timid, then don't, don't, don't come anywhere near journalism. You have to be brave. But if your work is motivated by the public interest, by societal interest, by societal change, societal advancement, you will always know when the overriding saying should be fortune favors the brave or 
no story is worth your life. You will always know. If it's not for self-serving means, you won't be pushed by adrenaline to take impossible risks. I'll give you an example. A British journalist once told me she wanted us to go to Sambisa Forest and interview Abubakar Shekau. I knew that it was impossible. I knew it was reckless. I don't, it's not on record anyway that any journalist He said, we, we seem to have lost you again. Hello, he said, we seem to have lost you again. We can't get you. I think we'll have to wait a few minutes until we get Fisayo back uh, so that we can resume the conversation. Hello everyone, uh, sorry about that. Uh, we lost the connection with Fisayo, but I think we are back online now. Uh, Fisayo, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you, I can hear you. Okay, 
Yeah. I'm, I'm um, sorry for the break in transmission. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all right. Let's uh, try to get back on the road. Um, yes. Yes, please I go ahead. Yeah, I remember I was saying that if your work is motivated by the public interest, by societal advancement, societal change, if your work is not driven by self-serving means, you will always know when to apply the brakes. You will know that this is risk taken too far. Um, for every risk you take, it is important to have your risk assessment. And you already know that if I run into trouble, this is my plan A, this is my plan B, this is my plan C, this is my plan D. As long as you have those workable plans out, then you can go ahead. For instance, I did a story uh, that required me to go undercover at a psychiatric hospital, the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Yaba. I was undercover for 10 days as their patient. A lot of people who read the story felt, oh, wow, this is risk taking too far. What if you were injected with psychiatric drugs to mess up your system and that's the end? What if you are given their drugs? And of course, if you are in psychiatric hospital and they give you drugs, you must take the drugs. They have crisis managers who, uh, who overpower you. And other people thought, oh, what kind of risk is this? But before I went in, I sat down with a psychiatric doctor for a long time and all the questions that were to be asked, I knew them. I knew how to answer them such that, because for every question, all the questions they ask you in about one and a half hours or two hours, the doctors are trying to establish two things. Is this case redeemable? Does this person require drugs or injection or admission? That, those are the two things they're trying to, and they ask different questions over two hours. Because I knew them, I knew how to answer such that their conclusion would be, this guy requires admission, this guy does not require injections, this guy does not require drugs. You know, I answered all, to, all those questions that way and I got in, I never had injection, never had drugs. But on the outside, it looks like he has exposed himself to the, to the probability of being injected with psychiatric drugs and disrupting his nervous system forever. So. As long as there is a plan, there is no risk taken too far in undercover reporting. But if there is no clear path to escaping the risks, then you should apply the brakes. Okay. So if you had a young um, a journalist who is trying to go undercover and you were speaking to them, what, um, what would constitute this plan in terms of the precautions that they must take uh, you took that kind of precaution to speak to a psychiatrist before getting to, to, to the hospital. What, in terms of pl the planning process, uh, must they keep in mind before going undercover? First, you have to identify the public interest. It shouldn't be in doubt. What exactly can the public expect to gain as a result of your story? That's the first thing. What is there to gain for the people? Second thing is, what are the risks that are involved? List the risks, and for each of them, how can you mitigate them? You know, three, what equipment do you need? Do you need a hidden device that you don't need one? Um, yes. Uh, what else? Understanding the story, understanding people who've done similar materials, understanding how your own work is going to be different, understanding how your output is going to spark change. Because at the end of the day, we do journalism to effect change, not just because we want people to commend us or we want some groups, organizations to award us, you know. So the, the, the path to change has to be clear. And of course, the reporter has to determine what constitutes change in this story. There are stories that can only be said to have sparked change when there is policy change. When the government says, now we used to act this way, we are going to stop it, this is the new plan. When the institution concerned decides to, to change its operations, there are times when the change is about apprehending the bad guys and, and, and trying them and jailing them. There are times when the change is only about bringing the issue to public life. If there is something that people are not aware of that is happening and you make them aware, that is change that is often underestimated because 
when you don't know that the problem exists, you can't solve it. The day you find out that there's a problem, even if it takes 10 years to solve, the, the day one is that day when it is exposed that there's that problem. So the reporter has to know what constitutes the change, um, has a clear plan about how to execute, how to get the different elements that are needed in the story, the people that need to be interviewed, the things that have to be seen. Um, yes, those are the things. And of course, the most important thing I would tell that reporter is have a presence of mind when you are doing your story. There are things that reporters miss on the field because when they're on the field, they are distracted. You know, 10 minutes of thinking about the football that you want to watch tonight, five minutes of thinking about your wife or your husband or your girlfriend or your mom or your dad. And these things happen because there are things that are information that are only available in a flash. In a few minutes, they're gone. And so I always tell people, just when you want to enter the field, just when you're getting to the site of your undercover investigation, take a minute. Ask yourself, what are the things that are exciting you at the moment? The things making you happy, oh, you just got the credit alert of $1 million, you just got this, you just got that. Think about them, smile again, put them aside. Then ask yourself, what are the things that are making you sad? The things you want from life that you don't yet have. Think about them, experience that sadness, then know that you are done thinking about anything else other than your story, which then means that you go, in, if you are spending four hours or 10 days, whatever, at the location, you are fully present and the minutest detail, you have it, you know, which means that if three people walk into your room without writing anything down, you can say one was wearing a black shirt and a, a, a blue pair of trousers. The other was wearing a flowing white gown. The third was wearing a fedora, you know, because you are fully present. And that is the way to write stories such that even when there are no pictures, even when there are no videos, people know for a fact that you indeed went for that story. They are not doubting in their heads because you are writing very graphically. And you can only write graphic reports if you were fully present when um, at the site of your story. Yeah. Um, you have mentioned uh, uh, several about the public interest and impact. Uh, let's just talk about that a little bit. In terms of the kind of stories uh, that you've done, uh, what kind of impact um, have you uh, got? And then two, beyond doing the, the actual under, undercover reporting, what else did you have to do in order to, to see some impact? So sometimes you write either one-off story, or in your case, you have serialized some of these stories, a number of, um, you know, you've done a series, uh, several parts. Uh, but beyond uh, documenting what happens inside the prison, what else do you do to, to, to push to ensure that there is impact? And then what kind of impact have you had for your stories? Thank you. Um, for impact, the, the, the most impactful story I've done was in 2016. It was a five-part series on the plight of soldiers who got injured while fighting Boko Haram. Um, now, a lot of those soldiers spoke to me and asked not to be named, but there, there was this particular soldier who said, look, I'm down already. If the army wants to sack me, let them sack me, you know? Soldiers who fought Boko Haram, and then they got injured and were abandoned. This guy had been begging the army for a post event. Boko Haram shot him in the leg while he was defending his boss after a Boko Haram attack, and then his leg was amputated. The army promised him a prosthesis, and they never gave him for a long time. And eventually, when they gave him, they gave him one that was really bad. It was clear that some illegal exchange of money had gone down between some officials of the army and the hospital. They were supposed to be sent to Germany, you know, but they went to look for one private hospital in Lagos and. Effectively, he had no prosthesis for 44 months. That's like close to four years. But when I did my story, I published it. The Nigerian army got angry. By the way, I, I, parts of the story were undercover because I went to hospital, the 44 military hospital in Kaduna, and the, the hospital at the Memelari Cantonment in Borno State, Meduguri. In both cases, I went in undercover. I had recording devices. I saw the conditions that the soldiers were in, and they were quite unfit for people supposed to be 
heroes, you know, Nigerian heroes. And after I published the story, Dami gave him a prosthesis. When I went to interview him for the story, he was effectively a one-legged man. His wife was pregnant, heavily so. So the wife was taking care of herself, of her unborn baby, and her one-legged husband. But after my story exposing the things that I saw, the army gave him a prosthesis. And I went back to see him. He was walking almost normally. You know, he could, by then his wife had put to bed. He could assist his wife, you know. I was so happy that a story that I did made life easier for a family who would probably never be able to say thank you to me. And as a matter of fact, Uh, Fisai, your connection seems to, we seem to have lost you again. Uh, let's just wait and see if we can get Fisayo back. Uh, just give it a few minutes, sorry. Hello. Are you able to hear me? I'm sorry you lost me again. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, do you remember the last thing you heard? So I know where to continue from. Yes, you were you were talking about uh, the 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 soldier that the one-legged soldier who eventually you know you managed to get uh, support for, and um, yeah, let's go ahead with that. So you were describing the impact uh, that some of your stories have had, and uh, can you hear me? The, yes, I can hear you. So the discussion that um, I think you went off when you were still describing the kind of uh, help that the, the soldier got after you had written your story. Hello, Fisayo, can you hear me? I'm terribly sorry about that. We seem to be having a string of technical yeah, problems in, contact, in, in, in keeping contact with him, and it has to happen in the session in which we uh, have already lost two speakers. I'm really sorry for that. Um, but we are going to end it there. Um, uh, what I do want to tell you is that the next session at 2.45, which is in uh, just more than half an hour, you have a choice. Um, there is a master class on all aspects of COVID-19 and a very good lineup of people doing the master class as the main plenary. And we also have running simultaneously um, local sessions in each of the five places, including Johannesburg, so um, you can really choose which one you want to watch. But let me tell you, everything is recorded and will be up within a few hours 
on our on on our website and through Wova. Um, so whatever you don't watch, you can watch at your leisure whenever you want to. Um, so make your choice, but know that you um, can watch anything you miss at any time that suits you. You make your choice on Wova. Uh, between those selections, the plenary has translation, but the local sessions do not have translation. So uh, sorry again, and look forward to seeing you in half an hour. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Sorry about that. Thank you.